Hyperinflation in 1923. Germany faced hyperinflation in 1923, and things were not looking good for the European giant. But how was hyperinflation caused? What sort of events became the reason for hyperinflation in Germany? Also, did you know that the U.S. dollar was equivalent to one trillion German marks in the 1920s? Hello, 101 community. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. Today's video is about hyperinflation in 1923. Before we begin, if you're new here, make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications to never miss any updates. Now let's start. Background to hyperinflation. Germany experienced hyperinflation in 1923. Money's value fell dramatically. Several factors contributed to hyperinflation. Government policy aimed to compel the Treaty of Versailles provisions to modify. The economy was having trouble. There was little trust in banks and investments. International trade was challenging. When they combined, they caused hyperinflation, which rendered money essentially worthless. Million mark notes, and later billion mark notes, had to be printed by the government. One U.S. dollar was worth a trillion marks by November 1923. A newspaper would cost more than a wheelbarrow of cash. Farmers refused to sell their produce for worthless money. Food riots broke out, and locals marched into the countryside to pillage the farms, since shopkeepers couldn't replace their stock quickly enough to keep up with the pricing. Law and order were destroyed. Causes of hyperinflation. Government officials and economists looked for the reason for the debilitating hyperinflation to correct the situation as the typical German battled to exist in the early 1920s. They soon discovered that there was no single explanation for the cycle, but a collection of contributing elements that came together to create the ideal conditions for an economic collapse. Number one, excessive money supply. The quantity of money in circulation is the first thing to consider during every inflationary cycle. In the case of Germany, one must first comprehend the cycle's historical setting. Germany was on the classical gold standard system before World War I, which required that all of its legal tenders be backed by actual gold. The obligation to back all currency with gold restrained money printing. Therefore. Countries that were part of the gold standard in the 19th and early 20th century, which included practically every industrialized nation and their colonies, generally had very little inflation. However, as soon as the globe joined World War I, nations that required money to support their military expenditures immediately abandoned the gold standard. One such country was Germany. The Imperial German government amassed a debt of 150 billion marks to pay for its war effort. Additionally, it started a strategy of excessive currency printing, which resulted in six times as much money in circulation at the end of the war as there was at the start. After the war, the new German administration, known as the Weimar government, because of its capital city it shows, maintained the practice of excessive currency creation to support the faltering economy. According to Weimar economists, German export pricing would appeal more to international investors. Which would aid in the manufacturing sector's recovery. Foreign investors could easily purchase more German commodities with their own currency, which was significantly more valuable than the Reichsmark. Although the economists were right that German exports briefly rose, they neglected to consider the myriad of other factors fueling the inflationary cycle. Number two, Germany had to pay reparation to World War One winners. Germany was one of the losers of the First World War. It was consequently required to make huge reparations to the winners, namely France and Belgium, for the harm it caused their nations. More so than anything else, the reparation payments led to a negative balance of payments in Germany. The Treaty of Versailles caused Germany to lose territory, which meant it needed to import more raw materials to maintain its industry. The Weimar government and German corporations. Also had trouble obtaining credit abroad to finance industries that could inject money into the economy needed to make the payments. The Reichsmark consequently lost even more value. 
the German government considered currency devaluation a possible option, much like the internal debts it accrued due to the war. Still, in practice, it gave itself little leeway for economic maneuvering. Due to the previous administration's compelled reparations and wartime obligations, the Weimar government's financial predicament was made worse by its officials' incapacity to comprehend the complexities of the swiftly developing crisis. The Reichstag was mired in what seemed like perpetual deadlock, and the Weimar government had become incredibly myopic, the German parliament. In the Reichstag in 1921, the parties on the left and right were almost evenly divided. This may appear to many people to be the best system of checks and balances. Still, in 1920s Germany, it led to a possible political impasse, since neither side was ready to concede any ground. The necessity of raising taxes for social services, such as paying military pensions for veterans, was among the most important topics that neither side could agree on. The government opted to increase money printing to correct the issue, further depreciating the already falling Reichsmark. The Weimar government's incapacity to comprehend the gravity of the situation led to its inability to provide basic social services with non-inflated money. Instead of viewing Germany's economic problems for what they were, an economic process taking place within a complex system that was integrated with the economy of other industrialized nations, Officials and economists in the Weimar government saw them through the lens of the 19th century. Number three, two main events during that time played an important role in hyperinflation in Germany. Two unanticipated events that occurred inside and outside of Germany's borders served as the hammer that sealed the fate of the German economy in the early 1920s. The first incident was the June 1922 murder of German Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau. The killing sparked a financial crisis that saw the value of the Reichsmark plummet on international currency markets and prompted political terror in the increasingly unstable Germany. Following Reithenau's murder, French and Belgian armed forces occupied the Ruhr Valley in January 1923. By occupying the mineral and industrially wealthy Ruhr Valley, the governments of France and Belgium hoped to pressure Germany into paying reparations. But the occupation had the opposite effect. The Ruhr occupation significantly hampered industrial output, further devaluing the German mark. The Reichsmark had barely one trillionth of its pre-World War I value by November 1923. If you like the video so far, press the like button and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you want to develop yourself financially and want to take your future into your own hands, check the links in the video description. So let's continue. The end of hyperinflation in Germany. Germany's struggle with hyperinflation started slowly and took some time to climax, but it ended very fast. The Weimar Republic's administration finally succeeded in easing the process in 1923 by introducing a new currency known as the Rentenmark. The Rentenmark was backed by real estate, as opposed to the Reichsmark, which was not backed by gold or any other tangible asset. One Rentenmark bill was astonishingly worth one trillion Reichsmarks when it was originally issued in October 1923. Even though the Weimar government successfully ended the hyperinflation by the end of the year, the harm to the German economy, political system, and larger society had already been done. The German middle class was one of the numerous sectors that suffered from hyperinflation and never truly recovered their footing. Workers in the middle class and owners of small businesses were particularly hardly impacted when they witnessed their savings vanish overnight. Many middle class retirees were forced to return to the workforce, and many relied on friends and family's generosity to make ends meet. All of this led to a decline in trust in the Weimar government, which was further exposed as being feeble and incompetent when Germany experienced a brief economic depression between 1925 and 1926, despite the difficulties that Germany's hyperinflation brought about, some people were able to profit from it. Even when the economy is on the verge of collapse, others always flourish because interest rates always cause debt amounts to rise. Those who were already in debt in Germany 
benefited from hyperinflation since they could use the devalued currency to pay off their loans more quickly. Those with a good sense of business immediately picked up on this and borrowed money to acquire things with genuine worth, such as real estate, gold, and artwork, which they could then sell for a profit very fast. Once the hyperinflation haze cleared in 1923, stock market gamblers and German exporters benefited handsomely. However, the extreme right and left political parties and paramilitary groups may have benefited the most from Germany's hyperinflation. More and more Germans started looking to extremist organizations for solutions as the Weimar government appeared unable to handle the economic issues of the 1920s. The 1920s saw street fighting between right-wing paramilitary groups like the Freikorps and communist organizations like the Spartacus League, resulting in hundreds of fatalities by the decade's end. The National Socialist German Workers' Party eventually positioned itself as a strong alternative to the Weimar Republic, which it perceived as weak and decadent. Effects of the Economic Crisis in America the Great Depression severely damaged the U.S. economy in 1929. All banks collapsed by one-third. Homelessness grew, and unemployment increased to 25%. Housing prices fell, trade on a global scale failed, and deflation shot up. The stock market's recovery took 25 years. Although the Great Depression significantly impacted the United States, some positive outcomes emerged from it. For instance, the New Deal put in place measures to reduce the likelihood of another depression similar to the one that was happening back then. The economy dropped by 50% in the first five years of the downturn. The gross domestic product indicated that 105 billion was the economic output in 1929. That is more than one trillion in today's money. The economy started to decline in August 1929 one-third of all banks had failed by the end of the year. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the economy shrunk by 8.5% more in 1930. In 1931 and 1932, the GDP grew by 6.4% and 12.9% respectively. The country had experienced an economic downturn for at least four years by 1933. It had only generated 57.2 billion, half of what it did in 1929. Unemployment. The unemployment rate was 4.2% in 1928, the final year of the Roaring Twenties. That is lower than the natural unemployment rate. It more than doubled to 8.7% by 1930. And it had grown to 23.6% by 1932. It rose to a peak of almost 25% in 1933. There were about 50 million unemployed people. The unemployment rate at that time was the highest ever noted in America. The unemployment rate was brought down to 21.7% in 1934, 20.1% in 1935, 16.9% in 1936, and 14.3% in 1937, thanks to New Deal measures. However, in 1938, less vigorous government spending caused unemployment to rise further to 19%. Looking at the annual unemployment rate, you can see that it stayed above 10% until 1941. The time after World War I was crucial in world history because it helped prepare for World War II. Germany's hyperinflationary cycle from 1921 to 23 was one of the most significant if in erect, causes of the Second World War. The Weimar government stood by helplessly as prices increased by roughly a thousand percent during that time, and its currency lost nearly all of its worth. The excessive production of money, the inability to pay off wartime debts and reparations, and a few significant political events are the causes of that brief but deadly cycle. Even while the Weimar administration eventually stopped the hyperinflationary cycle, the German populace lost faith in it and started looking for answers elsewhere. That's all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon so you'll be notified of every update. Also, don't forget to check the links in the video description.
And while you are here, I'm sure you want to continue on the path of financial education. Click to watch the video appearing on your screen right now. I will see you there. Take care and stay tuned.